Welcome to the final week of Computer Science 1, day 1. There's only two classes this week. Uh, Friday is what's called a consultation day. Um, I guess the whole thing counts as office hours. I don't know. Um, for me, every hour is office hours. So I, don't, I don't really see what difference it'll make. Uh, people are scared because they're rocking from China launcher of space that's going to crash. Eh, yeah, it'll happen. The odds that you get hit, though, is pretty small. All right. Um, so yeah, so we got uh, we got today, we got Wednesday, and, and that's it. So Wednesday, we're going to talk about the final, and then the final will be uh, during finals week, which is next week, and we're done. So all of you hopefully should have done your capstone essay by now. Um, you need to submit it on Canvas, and you need to submit it to the um, GE coordinator. Yeah. Wrong college. Let's go on. I got Japanese homework due tonight. Good to know. Good to know. All right. Capstone GE essay. Good. Eighty-four of you guys did it. Good. 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 Um. It'll probably fall in the ocean. Yeah. It's. It's not the kind of thing I'd worry about unless it was coming directly at me. Yeah. It was gonna hit Fresno. I don't know. I'd maybe go to the forestier underground gardens. Hide there. <laughs> All right. Uh, tw 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 capstone G essay. So you need to submit it to the Fresno State ePortfolio site. Okay. So make sure you guys do that. That's um, not something I can really help you with. It's not something I'm grading you on, but it is something you need if you want to graduate. So the link is right here inside of the Canvas description. And um, you gotta do that. Uh, you are gonna be given your uh, peer reviews today. Let's see if those were assigned. It doesn't always happen automatically. Let's check. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like any of you guys have peer reviews yet. Signed, so I will assign you peer reviews now. Can't do finals, got hit by a rocket. That's funny. <laughs> We've all been there. All right, so all of you guys have peer reviews now, except for those that did not do the essay. If you didn't do the essay, you don't have any peer reviews. So you'll get a zero. Um, make sure you both submit it on Canvas and, on, um, and to the G coordinator. Okay. Alright, looks good. Can you grade my Space Invaders uh, right now? I mean, sure. Uh, message me. Message me a link for your Space Invaders. Uh, yeah, I I, I uh, pushed out two peer reviews to you guys. All of you should have been given two. When this peer review do, it's due a week from today, like always. Um. The. Uh, you got two? Okay. Yeah, uh, pick one of the two. Um, and if somebody's done the other one, then do your other one. Yeah, if you can. If somebody's done both of them, it's not a big deal. But in general, it's it's more useful for somebody to, you know, get a peer review than to not have one. Uh, the only reason why I do two is sometimes um, uh, a person submits an essay that's like, yeah, I didn't do it. And then there's not really anything you can uh, peer review on it. <laughs> you know? So... Uh, you get two options, but you only have to do one of them. Uh, it is due one week from now. Yes, 10 a.m. one week from now, from now, as with all of the discussions in this class. You could have had the easiest peer review. <laughs> I didn't do it. Okay. Uh, I don't know what to say, man. Uh, better luck next time. You know, I know. you did not do it. <laughs> all right. Uh... Can you grade my Space Invaders? I think all of the Space Invaders are graded. So let me check that. Uh, yeah, all, all the Space Invaders are graded. Um, all the discussions up till now are graded. Uh, Flappy Bird is currently getting uh, chewed through. So if you didn't submit the link to your uh, projects, because um, remember these assignments, because uh, the studio thing, like the first time we did the, the um, 
the scratch assignment. The studio, for some reason, didn't pick up a bunch of the students, and so the um, the where did Flappy Bird go? Um, the assignment says submit the URL here on Canvas. Also, add it on Scratch. So you need to add it to the studio on Scratch. So we have a collection of everyone's projects, and uh, you have to post the URL, the hyperlink on Canvas. And a lot of people didn't do that. And uh, like, why did I get a zero? Well, you, didn't. <laughs> you didn't submit the URL. Yeah. Because the, uh, it's, it's going through the studio on Scratch, like I said, it doesn't seem to always, like I refreshed it a few times and sometimes it shows different amounts of students. Um, I don't, I, I think this, I think the website was made for like uh, elementary school classes that have like 30, 40 students in it and not for college classes that can have a hundred people in it like this one. And so I, I don't think their website um, is very good, at least in that regard. But it's MIT. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's, that's you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is like the, the assumptions you make in computer science, the frame that you bring to making a website, let's say, will cause bugs if rea if reality doesn't correspond to your assumptions. If you assume that it's going to be a K-12 classroom and there's going to be 30 to 40 students in it, then when somebody shows up with 100 students, which isn't even like that, you know, big a difference, right? And as far as the computer is concerned, uh, and your website breaks because of it, then, you know, that's a problem. Okay. So... Um, we just have to turn that in right for the GE portfolio and nothing else, at least for this class. Um, yeah. So assuming that means, uh, your essay, you have to do the essay here on the discussion section, then follow the link that I gave you for the GE portfolio. Okay. Uh, so, uh, scratch is wonky because we have quite a bit of students here. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if you guys like did it and then you get a zero, just, you can always just message me. Like, it's not like I'm, I'm out to get you guys or something. It's just, um, like don't, don't give up. Just send me the link and I'll, I'll grade it manually. It's not, it's not a big deal. Um, final. Yeah. So the final is going to be during finals week. What we're going to talk about just, you know, we're going to talk about the topics on Wednesday, our final class. Um, but basically I'm, I'm, it's going to be like the midterm. I mean, there's going to be a window that you can take the final in. Once you start it, you'll have an hour or two to, uh, to do it. And so no fixed time. Just it's, this is an asynchronous class. You just take it whenever, whenever you like during the window. Uh, I might make it like, I don't know, Monday through Thursday or something like just whatever, whenever you want. Uh, it'll it'll be comprehensive. It'll go over all the topics in the class. There you go. Uh, if you've taken the midterms, you should know what to expect. Um, okay, so I think we've gone over most everything we want to talk about in this class. Um, the qualifiers. Yeah. Um, standards of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, we talked about all this stuff. So I'm just going to finish today by uh, um, summarizing um, the problem, I guess, with like what you might call internet society, right? So there's there's certain rules and norms that govern, you know, the internet, right? Like people, um, spoken or unspoken, right? There used to be something called netiquette, which is not a term that I've heard in 20 years, but um, uh, before people went on the internet, they, they were given oftentimes a handout on netiquette, uh, but it's like the social behavior for the internet. And uh, nowadays, I don't know, like, I don't know if people even followed it back then, but um, uh, if you go on Reddit, they, they have a Reddit, uh, which is a, um, derivative of this thing. I uh, sure I agree to your cookies. Uh, remember the human. Yeah, this is very similar to, to Reddit's uh, rules then. Remember the human. 
Um, and that's something you guys actually have actually done really well in this class. And I'd actually like to give you a real life clap emoji <laughs> because you guys have actually done really well in this class being respectful and um, courteous towards each other and being positive, you know, when, um, when talking online, because, um, one of the, one of the biggest problems with internet communications is that all, uh, facial expressions are lost, right? Humans are very high bandwidth at, uh, communicating uh, emotions using facial expressions. We have a huge number of muscles in our face, you know, and we can, <laughs> we can communicate a lot using our face. And when we're online, well, that's gone, right? So all subtlety and nuance. Uh, like I said, last semester when I taught this class, the first discussion, somebody posted, you know, you know, they wrote their thing for the discussion board. And then the first period, the very first peer review I read was like, whoa, buddy, I got to stop you there. You're just totally wrong. You know, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> right. Cause you, you can't, you know, all, you know, they're probably trying to be funny as it was. They just came off like they're an ass, you know, uh, know where you are in cyberspace. <laughs> cyberspace. It's amazing. Respect others time and bandwidth make yourself look good online. I know that's the that's my number one rule I always try to look good online <laughs> mm, yeah. Okay uh, Share expert knowledge help keep flame wars under control respect one another's privacy. Yeah, that's um, Yeah, so basically flame wars and drama is one of these things that constantly crops up in um, online context that you rarely see in person, right? Like maybe you got some drunk family member at Thanksgiving or something that it's just going to rant, but like usually people like hush them, you know, like, eh, yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's dial it down a, a notch, you know? And, uh, um, just not color accurate. What do you mean? Uh, yeah, and so moderators of like, you know, different forums will sometimes clamp clamp those down. But like, what happens? Like, if people have a disagreement, it's very common for them to just go back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and it just gets more and more heated and more and more sort of out of control until they're just saying, "Well, f you, man," you know, or, or something along those lines, right? You're just a moron, then, you know. And uh, yeah, it's it's one of that. It's, it's one of those really interesting things because we don't do that in real life. Like very rarely, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, maybe drunk people at a bar, you know, somebody shoves somebody and, you know, the other guy is like, whoa, man, what was that? And the other guy's like, sorry. And they're like, all right. <laughs> you know, like. You know, I, I have seen a fair number of fights break out at, um, you know, with drunk people. Um, but like, you know, the, the like, e even then, like when somebody runs into each other by accident, like usually it's like, whoa, sorry about that. You know, my bad. Um, I remember being in Puerto Vallarta in a mosh pit and the guy got mad at me for moshing. Like everyone's like running around like moshing, you know, there's metal, you know. Yeah, this guy gets mad at me for moshing and he starts swinging at me, you know, and I'm just blocking it, you know, I don't know. I, maybe that's the closest thing I can think of to a flame war where somebody just like gets out of control and just starts attacking and, you know, the police came and arrested him. And the, the bar bought me free drinks. So my friends were like making fun of me for losing the fight. I'm just like, I'm not the one in Mexican prison right now. So I don't know what you mean by me losing the fight, you know, cause I did not throw a single punch at that guy. I was just like just blocking at him, you know, you know, pretty sure he lost. <laughs> See, you don't want to go to mix in prison. Uh, so respect one another's privacy. That's, that's a big thing for internet etiquette. Um, the, uh, uh, there's something called doxing D O X X I N G. And that is when, uh, you post private information about somebody online, right? So, um, you know, uh, uh, you dig it, you dig into their profile and you, you find out, 
where they live. They maybe have posted some public uh, photos and you like look at it and you can see their street address. Like they're, they, they took a shot in front of their house. You can see their street address. And then from that, you can deduce where they are. Um, Do you guys ever follow the Sheila Booth flag thing? That was about four years ago. I like great, but what color is the shirt? <laughs> right. This shirt? It's green. <laughs> uh, did you guys did you guys hear about that? The Sheila Booth thing? With the flag? Uh, and so he kept posting shots of like a, a flag saying, uh, uh, what did it say? It was like, we... Do you guys know, first of all, who Shia LaBeouf is, the, the actor? He was in some crappy movies called Star... What was it? Not Star Wars. Transformers. This guy. He was famous for being in the Transformer movies and Indiana Jones' kid in the movie that didn't exist. <clears throat> there were only three Indiana Jones movies. I wish there was a fourth. Um, yeah, nothing else he did. Okay. So, performance art. Let's see here. I'm sorry. I'm not famous anymore. Where is the... Yeah, he's been, like, punching people. And, yeah. Let's see. She, uh... Uh, booth flag. He will not divide us. That's it. Yeah. So the uh, he kept posting shots of a flag saying he will not divide us, and uh, and basically like people on 4chan like turned it into like the world's biggest doxing competition. So like. Uh, they're like looking at birds and like, uh, like, okay, well that's clearly this kind of bird. So he must be near, I don't know, the Great Lakes, uh, like a plane flew by in the background. And so they, they looked at like the, uh, uh there, there's websites where you'd see all the flights in the world at one time. And they correlated the flights in the background of the, of the image and the time of day with his geographical location. Yes. Yeah, so this is four years ago. And, and they found the flag and they, they took it down and put up a, a Pepe flag instead. And, uh, and then he moved to a different location, put up the flag again with a camera on it saying he will not divide us. And then people, you know, based on the cloud cover and things like that, like with just very little information, like they, they kept finding his flag and taking it down and putting a, a Pepe the Frog um, flag up instead, which, you know... It's, it's almost kind of terrifying, right? Because, you know, just based on that little, you know, information, you know, like somebody could probably tell from, I don't know, the, the artwork behind me, you know, like, oh, well, that was bought in Chinatown and, and <laughs> I don't know, right? And so it's kind of funny, but at the same time, it's kind of terrifying, right? Because when the internet was is like out to get somebody, right? Like they can put two and two together and... Um, and, and find out where you are physically in real life, you know, fairly, fairly easily. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they're like checking like flight radar maps and things like that. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a thing, you know? And so respecting one another's privacy, that's what you're supposed to do. But yeah, when people hate somebody, when somebody's a target, then, uh, they, they get doxxed. Right. And, uh, and if a lot of people don't like somebody, then, uh, you know, you know, privacy can be uh, violated apparently pretty easily. So, uh, <clears throat> GeoGuessr. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I did, uh, I did that. Um, what was the new one? There's like, there's a new GeoGuessr. I don't remember the name of it, but I was doing that last month with some former students of mine they were doing one in uh japan and uh the, the first one they pop up i had actually 
it was actually the Osaka, Shino Osaka um, train station. And I, I was like, I've actually eaten at that bakery there. Uh, I know exactly where this is. And uh, they're like, oh, you're so good. I was, like, eh, I was just lucky. But <clears throat> Don't abuse your power. Yeah, so that's that's a big issue these days, right? <clears throat> is like the role of moderation. Like we talked about, we talked about corporate censorship and we talked about, you know, to what extent corporations should be able to remove things on their websites, you know, and um, that legally, right, legally, the First Amendment does not apply to corporations, right? I mean, they, they, corporations have First Amendment rights, but it does not apply to you posting on some other website. So if you post on to Canvas uh, or the discussion boards, something horrible, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably delete it, right? And so uh, the there's the government, there's corporations, there's people, and there's this weird tenuous balance of power between them. And, uh, and so moderators are like kind of a fourth factor in that. So they're usually um, volunteers, right? So you usually have government, corporation, moderators, users. And, and um, so moderators are like used for communities to self-censor, right? So like I have friends that run large Facebook groups, um, um, you know, Gundam fanatics or whatever with 40,000 people in it or whatever. And yeah, you spend, a, you spend a lot of your time, you know, kind of reading through the forums and somebody posts some spam, you delete it, you know. And that's, that's part of the kind of normal operation of the internet is that usually communities will engage in self-censorship and that works fine until the moderators have used their power, right? And so if, for example, um, a moderator is a fanatical partisan, polit political partisan, and they delete anything that disagrees with their political views, that would be an abuse of their power. And it's unfortunately all too common, uh, especially in um, areas like Reddit, right? Where the, the moderators will, you know, they'll, they'll be moderating some, you know, non-political subreddit and, you know, they'll allow posts from people that agree with it, agree with them. But if anybody posts something to disagree with them, they delete the post and ban the user, right? Which is an abuse of power. And uh, it's, fairly common as far as I can understand. Um, Gundam, good mech anime. Uh, you technically don't have the First Amendment while in school. Mm, no, uh, was it Duncan versus Ohio? Was that the... No, I misspelled Duncan. Duncan versus Ohio. Uh, Dunchon. <laughs> Duncan versus Ohio. Let's see. Yeah, the, the Supreme Court has ruled that you do not lose your First Amendment rights when you uh, enter the schoolhouse gate. And let's see if I can find the, the case. Um, but yeah, it's it, schools, especially K-12 schools, it's, it's kind of weird legally. Uh, and again, I'm not a lawyer and uh, don't listen to anything that I say about it. But um the uh, the schools operate in what's called in loco parentis, which means they are your uh, parent, essentially, they're, or in place of your parent. So a lot of the rights that you give to parents actually apply to a school when um, when you're there. <clears throat> Tinker versus Des Moines. Okay. Yeah. 
Not Duncan versus Zion, my God. Uh, And so the question is, like, to what extent do you have rights as a school student, right? And, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, five students said to wear black armbands. The school in protest of the Vietnam War. And, uh, the principals of Des Moines schools learned of the plan and created a policy that said if you wore it, you'd be asked to remove it. If you didn't, you'd be you'd be suspended. <clears throat> okay, and so you know that was uh, uh, that was what that went up to the Supreme Court, and they ruled that they could not prohibit kids from wearing a black armband, even though you know they, even though you know the schools operate in a look apprentice, the. Um, <clears throat> They don't have carte blanche ability to prohibit the First Amendment. They do not leave, you do not lose your First Amendment rights when you enter the schoolhouse gate, is the ruling. And so um, that does, again, that does not apply to online forums, right? And so if a moderator were to abuse their power, um, there's more or less no consequences for it. You know, um, the forum that I, that I, I administer, right? I take it very, very seriously, you know, and, and I don't, you know, you know, I especially don't enforce my political beliefs such as they are on it, but I think it's very, very important, you know, the, the more power you have to, to be more serious about, you know, how you, uh, how you use it, you know, um, be forgiving of people's mistakes, consequences for poor and inadequate, um, yeah, um, it's mostly not taught these days, so. Yeah, so in, in online forums, uh, the, the biggest problems are the, uh, let's see, uh, flame wars, you know, just people not being able to express their emotion or sarcasm and things like that. And so that's why emojis exist. Emojis are a way of, like, conveying a facial expression. Do you guys ever think of it that way? Like, you know, uh, you know, you say something and you put an emoji on it as a way of, you know, showing, you know, whatever whatever kind of facial expression you're trying to convey it's a picture uh, it's not your face but it's a picture of a face that you know brothel you know so it's a way of, of, of trying to bring in a bit of that facial expression that we use when we're talking face to face so um, emojis are used really in two ways one is it's sort of a symbolic symbolic um language and then another as a way of doing facial expressions like so one thing is that the lack of facial expressions lead to flame wars another big problem with things online is people erase qualifiers people i don't know why it is but like somebody says you know um somebody says something that's qualified properly and the people responding to them erase it they erase the qualifier and they turn it into an all or nothing thing. It's the most common mistake I see online, honestly, <clears throat> where they straw man somebody by erasing a qualifier. It's super annoying to me. Um, subtlety and nuance is lost a lot online, you know? And, and at kind of a bigger scope, like this applies when dealing with like keyboard warriors, like people that are out looking for uh, ideological um, enemies, right? So, for example, um, it, and they and they typically lose all nuance whatsoever, right? Like like I posted a while back about that woman who said, you're, you're literally mansplaining here. You know, a, a woman had made this academic claim that farmers were responsible for a Japanese internment. I'm like, that's not true. You know, it was a military thing, and the military did it out of a misguided sense of, you know, racism towards Japanese people. It was not the Fresno farmers that got Japanese people locked up, you know, on the West Coast. Um, and you're literally mansplaining right now because it was a woman that made the claim. 
and you're a man, so that's mansplaining. And it's just like, you know, for one thing, I learned this from two women, right, Jill and, uh, uh, what was the other one's name, down at the Fresno Historical Society, you know. But two, like, like, okay, so like, mansplaining is like this thing where like a woman says something, then a man, because he's a man and she's a woman, will like override her or talk over her, things like that. It doesn't even apply necessarily in an online situation where like you're not over talking somebody and trying to correct her or explain something to her like she's an idiot. Like the woman had made like an academic claim, you know, and what are we just going to say? Like women academics can't be uh, argued against, right? Like female academics then have the greatest advantage in academia that have ever academia Right, they could just not have anybody respond to them, right? Like, you just post a paper, and if, like, nobody can respond to it in the negative because it'd be mansplaining, you know, not even other women, apparently, I don't know, uh, right? Then that is the greatest, single greatest advantage ever, right? You just, I, I'm sorry, I'm a woman, you can't disagree with me. Like, it's just utterly preposterous that somebody would say that. And uh, this was the same person that said that uh, the farmers had mayonnaise-colored skin which indicates an utter lack of knowledge of anything related to anything. So I've never met a farmer with mayonnaise colored skin, you know, uh, is there a rubric for the peer review? Uh, no, just, uh, it's the same as the ones before. So you just, uh, respond, give a thoughtful critique, go through their sources, see if the sources say what they're saying, see if the logic follows, uh, make sure they do a deductive, inductive and abductive, uh, thing. And you get 10 points. It's, it's pretty low key. Write a paragraph or two. It'll be good. Right, so keyboard warriors, perfect. Yeah, tone is lost, but like these keyboard warriors, they take a, they take a concept which has some basis in reality, right? Like undoubtedly uh, in reality, you know, like you're in a meeting and a man might over talk a woman and things like that. Um, they take that, erase all subtlety and nuance to be like, you're a man disagreeing with a woman? That's literally mansplaining. It's like, you know, and, and even if you look at like websites that like purport to explain what mansplaining is, uh, like they're horrible too, right? Like, uh, let's see if it's in my browser history, mansplaining, uh, mansplaining. And this is the BBC, right? You'd think the BBC would know better. Um, did, uh, did she ask you to explain it? Right, so this woman posted an academic claim that farmers were behind the Japanese internment. Uh, no, she did not ask me to explain it to her. Do you have more relevant experience? I would say so, yeah, I would. Because uh, this, because I've, I've actually read the um, a, a big chunk of General DeWitt's thing after she said this, because I mean, I've, I've had training on the subject. And then I actually sat down and read General DeWitt's thing, searching for all the relevant terms I could think of to see if there's any evidence that he was like, yeah, you know what? I'm doing this for the farmers, man. I'm going to lock up, you know, 40,000 Japanese people because of the farmers. That's why I'm doing it. No, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. But I searched for farms and farming and San Joaquin and all these things. And it, it turned up and it talked about Japanese farmers and things like that. There's absolutely no evidence that he was doing that to give the land of the Japanese farmers to the white people. None whatsoever. But I did that. I'm pretty sure she didn't. And I'm pretty sure none of the people in that internet forum, they were all flaming me because... How dare you, you know, uh, you know, criticize, you know, disagree with a woman, which is ridiculous. And this is why I don't generally participate in open internet forums, you know. Uh, yeah, so I would say I, I do have more relevant experience. Would most men with her education experience already know this? Uh, no, I don't know. Maybe. Yes. I don't know. Uh, did you ask if she needed it explained? No, I did not ask if she needed it explained then it is probably mansplaining. <laughs> Did you ask if she needed to explain? No. It's probably mansplaining. Like, what the hell, BBC? Really? Really, BBC? Come on. Come on. Like, you know, the, this is one of the most ridiculous things. If she said, yes, you may, you may explain it to me, then uh, only if you have more expertise... And she wouldn't know it. And then she gives you permission to explain it to her. Then it's not mansplaining. It's utterly ridiculous. And this is the BBC, right? This is British Broadcasting, right? And uh, if somebody asks you a question, explain away. 
you are making bad assumptions about confidence. How does your bias? Yeah. It's ridiculous. And so, uh, so in online circumstances like these, you know, things just kind of get out of control. Like somebody posts a valid criticism of social conduct and then it spins out of control. Like unless a woman gives you permission to disagree with her, it's mansplaining. Right. And, uh, uh, cultural appropriation would be another another example of that, right? Where like these uh, internet keyboard warriors get like upset at like um, uh, Boston kimono exhibit. So like the um, Boston kimono exhibit in Race Rail, right? The Boston Museum of Fine Arts did uh, they had a, a exhibit on kimono right kimono is japanese um there you go and this fascination is orientalism <laughs> people gathered to sketch the model and painting this fascination is orientalism uh so this is actually a monet painting monet was a huge weeaboo right like monet uh or was that manet uh do, 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 Let's get those two guys confused. Monet. Yeah, it is Monet. Okay. <clears throat> so he was a huge collector of Ukiwe, as, as am I, and collected uh, fans and kimono and things like that. He was a huge fan of Japanese culture. And so he actually painted his wife wearing her kimono. And so at the uh, at the exhibit, like people could try on the kimono and get a photo taken with the Monet. And protesters quickly labeled the event as racist, saying it propagated racial stereotypes and encouraged cultural appropriation. Right. And so I actually went to Japan about, uh, it was 95, no, uh, not 95, 2015, wow. Uh, 95. Yeah, I went to Japan uh, after this. And uh, at a kimono shop, they actually had a essay up responding to this. And what the essay said in English, was please stop trying to help us. <laughs> You're not helping us. When you um, when you tell people it's cultural appropriation to wear a Japanese kimono, then people are not going to buy a Japanese kimono. The number of Japanese kimono manufacturers in Japan has declined from like 8,000 to like 100. And so the, the industry is in trouble. The only thing keeping it alive are tourists buying kimono we love it when tourists buy kimono. It is keeping a traditional art alive. By doing this kind of outrage against us, you are killing us. You think you're helping, and you're killing us. Please stop. Was essentially what it said, but it was much more polite than the way that I just phrased it. And uh, it's not racist if it looks cute and exotic. You see all these these people. They think they're helping, you know, and and the, the manufacturers themselves of kimono in Kyoto were like, bro, no, stop. Please stop that. Like... You know, if you're telling people it's racist to wear a kimono, they're not going to buy a kimono, right? Because people don't want to be racist. And um, and that doesn't get any attention, right? Like, this gets attention, right? But the response where they're saying, no, 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 it's really, please stop trying to kill us, you know, doesn't get any attention. And, and what's ironic is that the people that are speaking out against the cultural appropriation are doing it to defend, you know, the, the Japanese uh, people, you know? And, uh, but, but they didn't bother to check, right? Like the people they're helping, they didn't bother to check that they're, they wanted the help and that their help isn't actually killing them, you know? And so the, the whole, the whole thing was just this giant, um, like just giant shake, shaking, head shaking event, you know? Uh, the MFA said, we don't think it's racist, but then they canceled it. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, when, when people, when people get outraged, then, uh, you know, basically people cave to their, their things. Right. So, um, outrage, there was considerable outrage on social media. And once, you know, I, I, we got five minutes left, so I'll, I'll just summarize the, uh, the, um, we, what people have realized is that the standard we have for conduct is based on if what you say 
offend somebody else, then what you said is wrong, right? And so whoever can get offended the, the hardest, you know, and the easiest, they have the most power, right? And so uh, it's it, when you incentivize people to become offended easily and when you incentivize them to become outraged easily, then uh, you give them, they, then people will do it. You give them power and they will do it. And it's, um, and nobody, nobody ever, you know, apparently, you know, like here, this is the BBC, right? It's a generally considered a fairly reputable news organization, right? Nowhere within here do they, talk to you know actual Japanese people in Japan <laughs> who make kimono or anybody in Japan right instead uh, you have Facebook users being quoted right I'm embarrassed for you uh, just because you don't think it's racist or cultural appropriation it does not make the impact right like they're they're quoting they're tweeting they're, they're quoting tweets and Facebook posts and they don't actually interview this is a news organization they're not even interviewing the people that are actually being harmed by it which is the kimono manufacturers you know what I mean and it and and that's like in essence what i think the biggest problem with the internet is right now which is that anything that's outrageous and we, we talked about this before the headlines right we we had the Wa the wapo um headline where it, apparent or the new york post sorry uh headline where andrew Cuo uh, governor cuomo was supposedly admitting to touching people and all he was admitting to was shaking their hands right like there there is a big serious problem with how media works and how you know, outrage works and things like that. And they're linked together, right? Because this is a reputable news organization and they don't do their due diligence on it, right? And uh, and so as long as this goes on, like I, I, I you know, my, my prophecy is that until, you know, the news organizations in particular kind of get their act together, uh, it, you know, the more, the wilder, the more, the more clicks you get, you know, and, and they're just going to keep flaming extremism and fl inflaming, you know, passions and things like that instead of, I don't know, doing their job. You know? So, uh, partial information creating misinformation. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way of putting it. And so, I, you know, this was a press release. This wasn't like just some random paragraph that I read somewhere like this was a press release and it didn't get picked up by the people that should have picked it up the media right the media should have done their due diligence and you know saw what people were saying about it um, especially the people that are supposedly being harmed by it and they didn't and so it just uh, you know it, it's sort of this self it, it's like a positive feedback loop right where people get outraged and the media picks it up and that encourages more people to get outraged because, oh, I might be famous. You know, if somebody, uh, if somebody quotes me, look, I'm a tw my tweet got, got up on BBC, you know. Um, so, uh, where is it? Tumblr page. Yeah, fantastic. Stand against yellow face. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, it's a problem. And... I don't, I don't. I don't have an easy solution because if you if you have a more responsible news organization, then you're not going to get the clicks, I guess. You know, and clicks are the money. So, except BBC is publicly funded, so you know BBC is actually funded by the uh, British government. You know, so they really don't have that excuse. You know, to hunt after the clickbait titles and, and things like that as well. So, yeah. So nuance, subtlety. You know, all of that, you know, gone on the internet. Um, and you guys, when you're quoting people for your essays and things like that, and, and when you're looking at other people's things, always, um, always be cognizant of the fact that the media itself can have a bias, right? So like, if you, just because, uh, you know, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true, right? Like we just saw there. And so always be aware that media organizations can be biased as well. Just because the media organization says something should always have that sort of skeptical, like, mm, let me see, let me just grab something from a different news organization and see if they agree, you know, see if there's a different point of view on it, things like that. Whenever, whenever you look at a source, always be like, where is that source coming from? You know, it doesn't mean that they're wrong. 
right? Bias doesn't even mean they're wrong, right? Kobe, Kobe Bryant's mom was probably very biased to think that Kobe Bryant was the best player in the NBA. It doesn't mean she was wrong. You know, you can make an argument that Kobe was the best player in the NBA. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't know. It depends how you look at it. But like, um, uh, you know, she was biased. It doesn't mean she's wrong. But when somebody's biased, it means you're not going to get a different perspective on it, you know? And it being a critical thinker, I think in large part has to do with understanding nuance, understanding different points of view. Like, what did this person say about it? All right, let's, let's find somebody who disagrees with them. See what they say about it. And then maybe find a third person and see what they say about it. And then after you've kind of seen the different points of views on a topic, on a debate, on an issue, then you can sort of make, you know, you, you're more informed, right? A big part of being a critical thinker is just having enough data to inform your decisions, you know? And, and if you get your information from a biased source, they'll only present information from one side, right? And usually there's... Um, other things to consider and they'll just neglect to they'll just neglect to say those things right it's what we talked about before last time with the uh, manufacturing consent and things like that they'll just neglect to mention things that run contrary to their narrative and so you have to actively seek out and find other points of view and uh, and that's why i really value the fact that um i've got friends that are communists and i got friends that are uh, pretty extreme libertarians and and everything in between you know and from that, it's like, you know, you get to hear because they all have their sources of information, right? And then, you know, one of them will mention something like, hey, did you know that, you know, oh, I didn't know that, you know, tell me about it, you know, and, uh, and then you, you get to learn new things, you know, and, and I think having as broad an input into your brain as possible is, is really important. Right. Get get information from as many different sources and different perspectives as possible and then make up your own mind. Once once you've got enough data, then make up your own mind on it. Don't you don't you don't have to be one of these people that just never takes a stand on anything. Um, it's the uh, reserve of the modern man, as Winston Churchill put it, is that people are afraid to take a stand on things and they're afraid to say this is what I believe uh, because they're afraid they'll be wrong. You know, you don't have to worry about it. Like, I, I think that's kind of silly. It's pretty common, but I think it's kind of silly because, you know, at a certain point, like, yeah, I think this is right is a justifiable statement. You know, you've, you've done your research, you've gathered the data, you looked at it from different points of view, and you're like, yeah, I think this is right. And just stake your claim, put your flag down on it, be like, that's what I think is correct. And, and just, you know, try and defend it, you know. And yeah, people will disagree with you, and that's not the end of the world. If people disagree with you, it's fine. You know, just make sure you have facts and you can defend yourself. And that's the best thing we can hope for. And, and usually there's a sign that you've, be, like, especially when it's with randos on the internet, it's like when, when people don't have any facts to disagree with you and they just say, well, I just disagree anyway. That's usually a sign that you've won. They will, they'll never say it, you know, but like, well, we're just going to have to agree to disagree or something like that, you know. Uh, you just need to read more on the issue. You're, you're clearly ignorant. Yeah, all those things are ways that they're conceding defeat without admitting it because nobody ever admits they're wrong. Very few people. Every once in a while it happens. Somebody will admit they're wrong, but it's very rare. Usually they'll just be like, well, you just need to read more. Or, yeah, I, only an ignorant person would say something like that. They, they, they'll usually move to ad hominems and, at a certain point. Uh, the opposite of deflationary, that's untrue. That's just not right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and that's that's usually a sign because if, if they can't make a claim backed up by evidence to disagree with you, they still don't want to admit they're wrong, so they'll just be like, no, that's, that's not right. Read more theory. Uh, go back to college. Take your class on it. Yeah. Uh, but they, okay, what should I, if I were in a class, what, what would it say? Anything? No? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was in a flame war recently where a guy accused me of, of, of lying. And I'm like, uh, you're completely wrong, dude. Uh, you know, he's like, I've got screenshots to prove it. I'm like, all right, where are the screenshots? And he's like, other people have the screenshots. I'm like, where are your screen? You said you had screenshots. Where are your screenshots of these things that I said that I've literally never said? It Dead silence. You know, a day later. Hey, dude, it's been a day. Where are those screenshots? Dead silence. Hey, dude, it's been two days. Where are the screenshots? Dead silence. It's been three days, dude. Where are the screenshots? 
He's like, uh, let's just move on. <laughs> it's, it's just not worth it anymore. Um, I, I went back and looked at it and somehow you, uh, you, uh, I, I can't find the things that you said. And I don't know. God, drove me crazy. Dude was straight up lying about me, you know? And uh, let's just move on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, where you're like, he said he had screenshots on his computer. Like, I, you know, I can't go, did I go onto your computer and delete your screenshots, you know? And then he went back into the thread where he said that I had said things that I didn't say and he couldn't find, it's because they didn't exist, dude, and you're just lying about it, you know? It's like, one of these wrong, uh, I don't know, you somehow, you know? <laughs> what the hell, dude? Uh, yeah, it was, like, it was like with the legal case, right? Like the, when I, when I sued Maricopa County, they said they had sent me an email, but they didn't have any record of it, you know? I didn't have a record of it, you know, and the, and the judge actually wasn't a judge. It was, you know, moderation it was like, uh, that's it. Your whole case is, your whole thing is based on an email that nobody could find. Like, you know, come on, you know, hundred percent to Kearney. Yeah. When somebody tries to prove me wrong about something. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Go away. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just annoying. So, but the guy was trying to engage in like uh, reputation sabotage, you know, he's, and so, uh, I actually did kind of have to defend myself in that case, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's the downside to the internet, right? Like people can just make accusations and you ask them for evidence and they could just not respond, right? Show me the evidence of what you say is true and they don't have any, they can just not answer, you know? And then their accusation still stands and, you know, and that's it, right? It's not like you're in a face-to-face -face conversation where you'd be like, really, what's the evidence for that? You know, online, they just like close the window and just not admit they're wrong. You know, so. I don't know, anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, let's just move on. It's not important now. <laughs> Kills me, kills me, yeah. So my advice to you guys is, uh, don't use the internet. <laughs> nah. nah, like social media in general is just terrible. And any sort of open forum where like, you don't know the people, it's even more terrible. You know, if it's, if it's with your friends, it's one thing. It's like, I don't game on any of these open voice channels or things like that. I've never once I've, I, you know, I used to Xbox game all the time. I've never once been on a voice chat with like random, random people on the internet ever. You know, it's always, I'm in a party with my friends and we're talking and it's great. So I've never encountered any of these jerks, you know, saying I'm going to F your mom, you know, stuff like that. Just avoid, avoid it. We'll, we'll conclude the semester with a, uh, rule number one of the internet, avoid the internet. Yeah. Or at least avoid, avoid random people. Um, So we will, we will end the semester with a small amount of cursing. Hopefully you guys are old enough to not uh, be too horribly offended by this. But uh, this is, um, I think, actually rather, rather accurate. Uh, no zoom in? Really? Okay. View image. Zoom in on this. Okay. Normal person plus anonymity plus an audience turns into. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Any, anytime you have those ingredients, then you know, behavior just goes down the drain. And I, I, I would honestly just avoid them. You know, it's just not worth it. A lot of them are just doing it to troll, and so. Uh, so avoid the internet. You'll be fine. <laughs> That's it for today, guys. Thanks a lot. We'll do the final review on Wednesday. And uh, uh, there'll be one more, I think, Zybooks reading. And then that's it for the semester. All right. Thanks a lot. Peace.